Hey guys, it's Metagosis Perfect Snedas, where medicine makes perfect sense. Welcome back to my clinical biochemistry playlist, where we talk about the clinical applications of biochemistry. This playlist is all about diseases. In previous videos, we talked about sorbitol, which can lead to cataract in patients with diabetes mellitus. We talked about glycogen storage diseases, which can affect my liver, my muscles, and my heart. We talked about reducing sugars in the urine, lactose intolerance, galactosemia, and the pancreatic islet cell tumors like insulinoma, glucagonoma, somatostatinoma, gastrinoma, and even VIPoma. Then we talked about cystinuria, cystinosis, homocystinuria, and Marfan syndrome. Today it's time to tackle the topic of hereditary mitochondrial diseases, which follow a mitochondrial pattern of genetic inheritance. Recall, what's the normal function of the mitochondrion? To make energy. Therefore, if I'm not making enough energy, who's gonna suffer? The most active organs will suffer the most, such as the brain, the eye, and the optic nerve, the heart, the muscles, etc. Please watch the videos in this clinical biochemistry playlist in order. Remember, you have two types of DNA. The DNA DNA that's in the nucleus, of course you have heard of this, and a mitochondrial DNA in your mitochondria. Where did my nuclear DNA come from? Well, half of it from mommy and half of it from daddy. Because remember, the ovum had 23 chromosomes and the sperm had 23 chromosomes. And now your nucleus has 46 chromosomes. So half from mommy and half from daddy. Where did I get the mitochondrial DNA from? You got 100% of it from your mother alone because your daddy left his tail outside. I'll explain shortly. Recall the structure of the mitochondrion? Amazing! What's the outer part? That's the outer membrane. And then what's that membrane called? Inner membrane. Between the outer membrane and the inner membrane, what do you call this lovely space? Intermembrane between membranes. Space. Amazing. And what are the names of these infoldings? Crestae, which increase the surface area available for oxidative phosphorylation to help you make more energy. Cool. And then what's the inner filling? The matrix. And look at this doozy loozy. Who's that? Your mitochondrial DNA, abbreviated mtDNA. What's the normal function of your mitochondrion? To make energy, lots of ATP, because of oxidative phosphorylation in the electron transport chain. By the way, to learn more about the ATC, I have a video titled Electron Transport Chain, and you'll find it in my biochemistry playlist. Two words, oxidative phosphorylation. Where is the oxidative part? Here is the oxygen for you at complex four. Where is the phosphorylation part? Phosphorylation of ADP so that it becometh ATP. Oxidative phosphorylation. Medicine makes so much sense once you understand what the flip you're talking about. Recall fertilization? Of course I know it. It's when the sperm met the ovum. That never happened. If you want to get technical, it's when the sperm met the secondary oocyte. Only then, only when the sperm meets your secondary oocyte, will the secondary oocyte continue its meiotic division and becometh a mature ovum. And then X plus X, that's a female newborn. X, Y, that's a male newborn. This is the structure of the sperm. Look at the middle piece of the sperm, which is the beginning of the tail. It has the mitochondrion, which provides energy necessary for the sperm movement. Now the sperm is ready to fertilize the secondary oocyte. When the sperm fertilizes the secondary oocyte, the future ovum, it leaves its middle piece and tail outside. Which means the mitochondrion of the sperm will be left outside the ovum. It will never enter. The mitochondrion of the sperm will never be part of the zygote. Which means when your daddy went deep inside, he left his tail outside. And that's why your mitochondrial DNA came only from mommy, not from daddy because daddy left his tail outside. Now on to today's topic, hereditary mitochondrial diseases. Where's the problem? It's a mutation in the mitochondrial DNA, all right? Oh, by the way, if you studied biology carefully, you remember that mitochondrial DNA has a higher mutation rate compared to the good old 
nuclear DNA. Because the proofreading mechanisms are more robust in the nuclear DNA than in the mitochondrial DNA. The mitochondrial DNA is more vulnerable to mutations and defect, which is exactly what happens in these diseases. Where did I get my mitochondrial DNA from? Only from the mother, not from the father, because the father left his tail outside. So the affected mother, who has a hereditary mitochondrial disease, can pass down this disease to all her offsprings, males and females. But if daddy is affected, we stop here. Daddy leaves his tail outside. Daddy cannot give a mitochondrial disease to his children. C'est impossible. So all of the offsprings of the mother can be affected with a mitochondrial disease. But all of the offsprings of the affected father are not affected at all. Some patients with mitochondrial diseases have a mild form of the disease, others have a severe form of the disease. What do you call this variation in expression? Variable expression or variable expressivity. Which reminds me of the French physician Trousseau who said, quote, there are two forms, forme fruste and forme plein. Some people have the typical full-blown picture of the severe disease. Others have an atypical, less severe picture of the same disease. We call this variable expressivity or heteroplasmy. So remember, mitochondrial diseases, heteroplasmy. They love to ask about this a lot in exam questions. Can you give me examples of these hereditary mitochondrial diseases? Yes, there is the infamous Leber hereditary optic neuropathy, and we have mitochondrial myopathies, which include many diseases. Let me give you three. Mellis syndrome, Murph syndrome, and kearns sayre syndrome. Recall that normally speaking, the mitochondrial DNA contains genes, and genes do what? They code for proteins, and these proteins coming from the mitochondrial DNA are associated with electron transport chain and ATP production, all kinds of energy. And that's why in these poor patients with hereditary mitochondrial diseases, which organs will suffer the most? The organs that are the most active and in the need of ATP the most. What are these organs that are the most active? Your optic nerve, your eyes, your muscles, your heart, your brain, etc. Medicine makes so much sense once you understand what the flip you're talking about. So let's talk about these four hereditary mitochondrial diseases, starting with number one, Leber hereditary optic neuropathy. A hereditary mitochondrial disease. Where's the problem? The problem is in the electron transport chain. Which complex? Complex one. If you have watched my video on the electron transport chain, you will recall that complex one consists of NADH coenzyme Q oxidoreductase, and oxidoreductase is also known as what? A dehydrogenase. A dehydrogenase is an enzyme involved in oxidation reduction reaction. That's what it means. If it hits your mitochondrial electron transport chain, it means you cannot make energy and your active organs, the most active ones, will suffer the most, such as the neurons of my optic nerve, my eyes, my retina, etc. Moreover, don't forget, my nervous system and my heart, all of these are very active organs. This disease is more common in males than females, and no one knows why. When these patients present to the doctor with symptoms, they are usually in the second or third decade of life. When is the third decade of life? Oh, it's between age 30 and age 40. Shut the French toast up. The first decade of life is between age 1 and age 10. The second decade is age 11 to age 20. The third decade is between age 21 and age 30. Where did you go to school? Man, doctors suck at math, let alone statistics. In labor hereditary optic neuropathy, we get what? Optic nerve degeneration, which affects the neurons of the optic nerve. And of course, the optic nerve is connected to the sensory layer of your eye, which is the retina. So the retina will suffer and your vision will suffer. And this, of course, can affect both eyes bilateral and which part of the vision? It starts with the central vision. So the central visual field is lost first. What do you call this? Central scotoma. Scotoma means like a blind area, an area that cannot see. Central scotoma gets bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger until I end up with bilateral complete blindness. Did this blindness happen all of a sudden, like in one day? No, it's not acute. It is subacute bilateral blindness. Why don't you call it chronic? Because it did not take 
27 years either. It is somewhere in between. Usually, this is irreversible. Unfortunately, we do not have a cure to these hereditary mitochondrial diseases up to this point. Some patients have tremors, others do not. Some have multiple sclerosis, others do not. Some have Wolf-Parkinson-White pre-excitation syndrome of the heart, others do not. The second hereditary mitochondrial disease is Mellis syndrome, which is an acronym, the M mitochondrial. E stands for encephalopathy, LA lactic acidosis, and the S is stroke-like episodes. Let me explain. When your mitochondrial DNA is toast, your electron transport chain is not robust, you cannot make ATP, the most active organ will suffer the most, such as your brain. And when your mitochondria is toast, you say goodbye to your aerobic metabolism. Instead, you will switch to the more ugly anaerobic glycolysis. Why do you call it ugly? Because in excess, it causes lactic acid accumulation or lactic acidosis, which causes high anion gap metabolic acidosis, which inhibits your neurons. If you recall your basic physiology, acidosis cases inhibit nerve transmission. How can I diagnose these patients? History, physical exam, lab results, and of course, genetic testing. Third hereditary mitochondrial disease is Murph syndrome. What does the M stand for? Myoclonus. So we have a muscle problem. E, epilepsy, nervous system problem. And then if I biopsy the muscles, what do I find? Ragged red fibers. How do you see them? You see them when you do a muscle biopsy, you put that muscle tissue under light microscopy and you use a special stain. Why are the muscle fibers ragged? Because of compensatory proliferation of mitochondria. When the body finds out that the mitochondria cannot perform their function, it keeps making more, but to no avail. So how can I diagnose this disease? History, physical exam, and then let's go to the lab, get me that muscle biopsy, and you'll see ragged red fibers on light microscopy. You'll find mitochondrial crystalline inclusions on electron microscopy. And of course, you need genetic testing. Next is kierns seyre syndrome, another hereditary mitochondrial disease. Most patients present with these symptoms before their 20th birthday. What's going on? Degeneration of the retinal pigment, so visual problems, painful eye, another ophthalmological condition, paralysis of the extraocular muscles. Normally, the extraocular muscles move your eyes up and down, right and left, etc. When you cannot do this, you get ophthalmoplegia, paralysis of eye muscles. And when you get ophthalmoplegia, for instance, this eye can look inwards or this side, but this eye cannot look outwards. So you get double vision or diplopia. When the mitochondrians suffer, the most active organs suffer the most, such as eyes, such as retina, such as heart. Conduction defects, arrhythmias, some of them are fatal. Light microscopy, muscle biopsy again, has ragged red fibers, as in Murph syndrome, which we have discussed before. These ragged fibers, of course, are irregular. The mitochondria are also irregular and they stain red. That's why they call them ragged red fibers. You can also say ragged red mitochondria. If you want to learn more about many cardiac arrhythmias, cases of angina, myocardial infarction, i.e. heart attacks, as well as as strokes, the ischemic and the hemorrhagic, then download my emergency medicine high yields course at medicosisperfectionalis.com. How do we treat arrhythmias? Many options, including many medications called antiarrhythmics, and they are five classes. You can learn more about them by downloading my cardiac pharmacology course at medicosisperfectionalis.com. If you do not want to download my premium courses but would rather watch them right here on YouTube, then click the Join button, choose the highest tier to gain instant access to more than 300 premium videos. Please subscribe, hit the bell, smash like, support my channel here or here, go to my website to download my courses, notes, and cases, or if you would like me to tutor you, I will happily tutor the medicine out of you. Be safe, stay happy, study hard. This is Medicosis Perfect Snellus, where medicine makes perfect sense.